few questions. Uh, after about uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, I'll open it up for your questions. The way to ask a question is go to the chat feature of Zoom, type in your name, your state, and a one sentence synopsis of your question. And then I'm gonna call on you, you'll unmute yourself, and then you ask your question. It's helpful to me if you type your question in in advance, just in case there's duplicate questions, I can prioritize uh, who to call on. All right, let's get into it. So I'm, I'm actually gonna say something bold, and I, I presume many of you might actually disagree with me on this. Um, I think Nebraska is the most radical state in the country. <laughs> uh, now, that's not an ideological statement. Uh, that I'm making. It's a cultural statement. It's a, pr a process statement because I personally think it is radical to stand up to, uh, to challenge the dominant culture of partisanship of, you know, red versus blue of this reductionist zero sum game politics that that has taken over our country. That's exactly what Nebraskans have been doing for decades. They have the only truly nonpartisan legislature in the entire country. They use a nonpartisan top two system to elect their state representatives. Those representatives like Adam Morfeld, who we're gonna meet, uh, serve in a nonpartisan unicameral legislature in which it is the norm for Democrats and Republicans to work together on tough issues and for members of different parties to chair legislative committees. Let me just repeat that. It is the norm, not the exception for politicians in Nebraska from the left, the center, and the right to work together on difficult issues. My, my colleague, Jeremy Gruber, wrote about this in great detail in a report Open Primaries produced called Myth of the Red State, which is a great read. There are literally dozens of, of examples of how legislators in Nebraska work together to solve problems instead of just going at each other like sharks and jets. So we'll send that report around to everybody in the chat section. So we're gonna talk about Nebraska today, uh, this radical hotbed of, uh, of problem solving and nonpartisanship. And I'm really excited to introduce you all to our guests. Uh, first, Jane Cleet. Jane is the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party. She is an experienced grassroots organizer political strategist and a nonprofit entrepreneur who was recently po profiled by PBS in a film entitled Blue Wind on a Red Prairie. She organized her fellow Democrats to change their party rules to allow independents to vote in Nebraska Democratic primaries. And uh, she co-authored an editorial with Kathy Stewart last year about the importance of the Democratic Party opening up their presidential primary and building bridges to independent voters. Our second guest is Adam Morfeld. He's been a state senator for six years representing Lincoln. He's also the founder and the executive director of Nebraskans for Civic Reform, a nonprofit working on a wide range of civic and reform projects in Nebraska. Adam and I actually became friends back in 2016 when he and a group of Republican and Democratic senators from Nebraska came up to South Dakota to campaign for Amendment V, which was an effort to bring the Nebraska style system up to South Dakota. We came this close to making it a reality, but unfortunately we lost. Adam is a, a, a true believer in the importance of breaking down partisan barriers and nurturing strong democratic institutions. So welcome, Jane and Adam. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks for having us. All right, let's get right into this. So the, the Nebraska legislature is nonpartisan. It's been that way for 80 years. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an island of nonpartisanship in a sea of partisanship. And by all objective measures, it's not just me saying this, objective observers have called it the most effective, the most innovative, the most cooperative legislator, legislature in the entire country. Legislators actually from around the country journey to Nebraska to get like tutorials uh, on how it's done. And then they go back to their states and, they, and nothing changes. Um, things only seem to get worse. So I have two 
big questions for you. See what you can do with these questions. Um, first of all, you've had a nonpartisan system for 80 years in Nebraska. How does this affect how Nebraskans think about and talk with one another about politics? In other words, how, how has this impacted on the people of Nebraska? And secondly, why does no other state want to copy what you've done? <laughs> Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump into those questions um, right away. Um, so first off, I mean, I think um, there's, there's truth in numbers um, and the numbers don't lie. Nebraska has one of the most popular and respected state legislatures in the entire country. Um, you know, I work on a variety of different issues, ballot initiatives, other things where we do polling and, you know, the third or fourth question is always, do you approve of the job that the Nebraska legislature is doing? And it's always in 50, 60 percentile. Um, and that's, that's one of the highest approval ratings of, of legislatures in the country. So first, Nebraskans respect their legislature as being a problem solving body. Um, two, I think what it's done is it's really, despite all of the partisanship and how hyper partisan people are, it's created a body in which we have very moderate policy in our state um, as compared to other states like us and around us. Um, and, you know, for instance, I think Kansas is a really good example. It's went from one extreme and now it's kind of going back to another, um, or at least moderating a little bit after going to that extreme. Whereas Nebraska is not too much different from Kansas in a lot of different ways. Um, but what is different is that we have a unicameral nonpartisan legislature and that nonpartisan legislature has really moderated the policy making. Um, so we don't have these huge extremes. That being said, the system is stressed because our statewide offices are becoming much more partisan. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of tension in that sense. Um, really partisan statewide executive officers trying to bring the, the unicameral legislature and, and some political forces outside of that too. And so I have always thought that the Nebraska legislature has been kind of a common sense bulwark against this hyper partisanship that we've seen. Um, so that's the first answer to the question. And then what's the second question real quick? John, Why, I'm sorry. I how come other states don't want to follow your lead? Oh, it's power. It's power. You know, I mean, and I, as you said, John, we have state legislators that contact us all the time, particularly our speaker of the legislature and say, uh, hey, things aren't going very well down here. Can you check out your model real quick? We've heard interesting things. And invariably what it is, is we go to these legislator conferences and they're like, wait a minute, you're you're unicameral and you're nonpartisan and you elect all of your committee chairs and your speaker by secret ballot election of the entire body and a bunch are of the opposite party, which is generally in the minority, like what is going on over there? So what happens though, is people bring these ideas back and the people that are in power go, well, wait a minute. I don't have to be the best fundraiser to be the speaker or the majority leader or the, you know, the majority whip or something like that. Like I, I have to get along with people and be kind of nonpartisan and be, and people have to trust me. I, I'm not into that. I'm used to this system. And so what it is is it's disrupting a system in which people are currently in power. And so I, I will say though, I've talked to a lot of legislators and there's a lot of legislators on both sides of the aisle that are tired of the partisanship, but they're few and far in between because of how partisan the other systems are. So the short answer is, is people that are currently in power don't want to be out of power. Yeah. How, how so, surprising. Yeah, how ahead, surprising, yeah. So I'll just jump in. One, I often talk about Nebraska being one of the most radical states out there, and people always chuckle, and I laughed when you said it. But it is true for a couple of reasons. One, we not only have the only nonpartisan unicameral where Democrats and Republicans and independents all have to get along if they want their bill to pass. Uh, because it's going to, you know, it takes the majority and the Republicans may have the majority, quote unquote, but uh, the Democrats do have enough to block a bill and with a filibuster. So the Republicans know that and it forces them to come to the table. But we're radical in many other ways as well. We're the only state uh, that has 100% publicly owned utilities. And so there's not a single private utility company in our state 
which also creates this sense of democracy on the very thing that people use every single day when you turn the light switch on. Uh, you can run to be on your public power board and decide if you want more solar, more wind, if you're gonna continue with coal. And that has kind of a thread of independence in working together as well in our state. The other is if you look at the kind of ballot campaigns that we've been able to pass in a quote unquote red state, so we've raised the minimum wage. We are about to pass medical marijuana. We will probably pass a payday lending bill, which essentially will say these payday lending folks can't do predatory lending, no more 400% increase. We passed Medicaid expansion. So we are able to bring forward kind of progressive policies that are normally seen as only democratic policies because all bunch of interest groups and nonprofits, as well as the Democratic Party and independents all work together on those ballot campaigns. And it's not seen as weird that all these groups are working together because they all work together to get bills passed in the unicameral. I will say one of the downsides being the head of the Democratic Party is that all of our rock stars are in the nonpartisan unicameral. And so often when young people look at our elected leaders and our state senators are the ones that they see the most, quite frankly, other than the governor, and they don't have a party identification attached to them, um, it doesn't help build the party and it doesn't help us uh, register young people as Democrats. And you're really seeing this kind of bear out in the numbers. I mean, obviously nationwide, you know, more people are registering as independents and that's a trend nationwide. But in Nebraska, if the trend continues as it is, the independents will be comparable to the Democrats in not many years. Um, so that also was an obvious political decision for me as a leader to say, we welcome independence. I mean, it drives me crazy at the national level when I hear plans being kind of put out by all the different strategists, you know, independents are the, you know, holy grail, it's what's going to win the White House for Biden or, you know, insert any other race, but yet we don't respect independent voters enough to add them to the voting ability in our primaries. Like if we want independents voting for Democrats in the general, then we should be opening up our primaries nationwide. So I'm a big champion on that, a big believer on that, and think that there are reasons why people choose to be independent. And as a party, we should be respecting that. Let, I'm so glad you brought that to the table, Jane. It's something I wanted to talk to you about um, because you, at just to bring everybody up to speed, you led an effort in Nebraska to change the rules of the Democratic Party to allow unaffiliated independent voters to vote in the Democratic Party primary for president and other offices. And right. you did that, that's been in effect since 2016, am I right? Mm -hmm. Got it. So this thing you're describing, your frustration with the National Democratic Party, I wanted to ask you about that because my experience, and I'm an independent, is that, for example, Barack Obama put together a coalition of moderate Republicans, Democrats, and independents that not only took the White House, but created the promise of doing politics in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that coalition was dismantled about four hours after uh, Obama got elected. And you're absolutely right. There's this, I experience it schizophrenic. You have Democratic pollsters some of whom to all they do is talk about independent voters and how important they are. Others don't even acknowledge that independents exist. They say there are no such things as independents. They're democratic leaners or Republican leaners. So what is the fear? What, get philosophical for a second. Yeah. Why do you think the Democratic Party is so schizophrenic, so tortured, when it comes to, I don't mean to get Freudian here, but when it comes to relating to independence in a positive coalitional manner. Yep, so I think there's a couple of things. One, when I ran for chair in 2016, one of my platforms was that I was gonna open up our primary. And you know, we had a lot of Bernie folks inside the party attending state convention uh, when I got elected chair. And quite frankly, I got elected chair only because there were so many Bernie voters, 60% of our state convention in that year uh, were from were Bernie Sanders delegates, and that's you know what brought me over the edge. Um, I'm not sure I would have won party chair uh, without that 
now obviously a lot of the established um, establishment democrats understand kind of my organizing and philosophy of bringing independents and different thinkers into the party but at the time that was a big threat and i was going up against our democratic establishment so we made the change formally in 2017 so 2020 is the first presidential campaign that independents were allowed to vote and we had a 600 percent increase in independents choosing a democratic ballot because technically independents could have taken a democratic ballot before, but their vote for president wouldn't have mattered. Uh, so it only mattered for a couple of the down ballot races. Mm. And so we've seen that it obviously matters. That helps our nonpartisan legislators who are running as well, because those that are belong to our party know which independents they should be targeting. But I think it's such a threat because the same reason why I think the Bernie Sanders voters were a threat to the Democratic establishment, they view politics very differently. Um, you know, it's not in this narrow lens of how the Democratic Party has been run for the last 50 years. Uh, independents and kind of, the, you know, far left, if you want to call them progressive voters, uh, really do see politics in a different way. So they are pushing policies like Medicare for all or decriminalizing marijuana. Um, or ending new fossil fuel pipelines. You know, when I was running for chair, that was one of the things that I also said that our party needed to be championing. Like, we do not need any more fossil fuel pipelines. Keystone XL was a big fight that I continue to lead in our state. It's a decades long fight. Um, and the only reason, the only reason we won that fight so far is because we brought Democrats, Republicans, and independents to the table to create this unlikely alliance of folks who, you know, may have very different views on guns and abortion, but we all agree on property rights, water, and climate change. And that's what I think threatens Democrats. The fact that you're going to have kind of all shades of blue and purple at the table, it will change the policies that we're moving forward. And from my perspective, for the better. Like I want independents and Republicans at the table and Democrats when we're talking about ag reform um, because they'll all have different perspectives. Some will have an urban perspective, some will have a rural, but that will make that policy better. But I think a lot of the Democratic leadership is like, you need to choose a team. And if you're not part of the Democratic Party, then we don't want you voting in our primaries. And I feel a different way. I just think there's a respect for voters. If we want you voting in the general, then you should be allowed to have a say in the primary. Well, I wish um, Tom Perez and his team would listen to you. That would be a big <laughs> development. Adam, a question for you. So there's, we, we had Professor Christian Gross on a month or so ago, and he, he was sharing some new academic evidence that politicians who get elected in systems that have nonpartisan primaries, which is only California, Washington, and Nebraska, but they're actually able to do their jobs better than in states that have partisan primaries. So how, just share personally, how does running for office in a, in a top two nonpartisan primary impact, impact on you personally, how you run for office and how you approach your job? Yeah. Um... So I need to read his research. Um, so I want to I want to do that. So I'll follow up with you after, and you probably sent it to me in my email box. But in any case, um, so first off, I, I want to say that while it's a bit revolutionary for us to be doing this in our state legislative races, nonpartisan primaries, it's not revolutionary in most places, right? I mean, so for instance, city council races, a lot of down ballot races, they've been elected nonpartisan for. For years. And so it, I think it's important to remember that and remind other people that if it feels scary. Second, to answer your question, when I go door to, the difference is, is when I go door to door in my primary, I don't just go and talk to the Democrats. I go and talk to the Democrats, the Republicans, the Independents, the Constitutional Party, the, you know, the Green Party, everybody in between, whoever's registered and likely to turn out. I talk to all of them. So when I'm going door to door, the first time as a candidate, I'm hearing all of those voices because all of those voices are gonna be showing up on primary election day. And so that makes me a, a more well-rounded candidate. It makes me a more well-rounded policymaker because when I go down to the Capitol after I win the general election, which they all vote in too, obviously, um, I have all those voices in my head and I don't feel beholden or accountable to one segment um, of the population. 
Now, I mean, there's a bunch of other factors, right? Um, you know, your donors, there's some donors that, you know, kind of fall along ideological lines. You get support, the parties are still involved. Um, they do their slate cards and they do those things. For the voters that really care about what party you're affiliated with, they can find out. But in Nebraska, there's an in by my name, since it's nonpartisan. So it's, you know, in my last year, well, my last race was unopposed, but the race before that, um, it was, there was three candidates, three ins, and um, I actually, the two people that came out was myself and another Democrat. Um, and so in the general election, I had to run against another Democrat. Um, and so long story short, um, what it does is it makes you a more well-rounded um, candidate. It makes it so that you're not feeling beholden to one particular interest, um, but yet you still do represent your district because my district is a college working class union immigrant district, right? Um, so obviously my views align with that district. So it's not like, for instance, you're just some free agent. You don't have to listen to anybody. Um, I could go on a little bit longer, but maybe that answered your question. John. No, that's great. Thank you very much. I have one more question for the two of you, and then I want to open it up here. And I apologize for the sirens in the background here. There's something going on in New York. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, Adam. There, there seems to be some tension in Nebraska. There, there, there's efforts from the governor's office to try to get rid of the nonpartisan legislature. Mm -hmm. But there also seems to be some efforts bubbling up from the grassroots to move a whole set of reforms further. Um, you know, vote from home, uh, redistricting reform, expanding the nonpartisan system to include federal and statewide offices. So where's that tension? How would you two describe that tension between shutting things down and moving things forward? You wanna go first, Jane? I can too. I mean, I'll, I'll kick it off and then Senator, um, you know, I'll throw it to you. So I do think that there is a real tension, like it's not just a perception of attention, like it's a real tension. And I think if Governor Ricketts had it his way, he would have a partisan legislature because he would know in towns like Grand Island and Fremont, these are two kind of more rural communities that are currently represented by Democrats, Senator Dan Quick and Senator Lynn Walls. He knows if there was a partisan ID label next to those two senators' names when they first got elected, they would have never been elected. And that's just the reality. So we have, like Adam said, mayors, city council members, county board members, all across the state of Nebraska. We have 550 Democrats running across the state of Nebraska, uh, 850 last time around when a lot of the municipal elections were up. 73% of those Democrats won in the state of Nebraska. And that's because they're mostly down ballot races and they're all nonpartisan. And so that is why Governor Ricketts and the Republican Party are continuing to push. Now, Quite frankly, I love that they are because I think it's political suicide for them. I think the vast majority of Nebraska voters are very proud that we are unique in public power and we're unique in our Nebraska legislature. We're also unique in our public school system. We don't allow any charter schools to get federal funding or state funding. So there's a sense of pride about our independence and how we do business. So while I think it's definitely a threat the Republicans are pushing, I don't think that they would ever be able to move forward. So bouncing off a little bit of what Jane said, I, I agree with all that. Um, there's a few different dynamics at play. First, I personally believe, because I've talked to my colleagues in, in California too, when they switched the system, I think any state that the ideological, I think any state where the ideological majority is in power, they're going to be suspicious of nonpartisan primaries because right now they have the power, right? And th what this does is it allows more voices at the table and it allows for moderation, right? Um, so it's always gonna threaten the status quo and whoever's in power. What, what we see and what we've seen the last two governors, not just Governor Ricketts, but also Governor Heineman, also a Republican, is that they were elected by a partisan ballot, right? And so they were elected by a partisan ballot by a minority of voters. Um, and then there were other dynamics in the general election that allowed them to be elected, right? Um, and so those folks are always going to be suspicious of a nonpartisan primary. And also they're used to wielding that type of power within their own um, institutions. And so, you know, they try to influence the outcome through, you know, the party mechanisms to 
get as many votes down at the Capitol. It's always very interesting, though, because even when they have the opportunity to appoint, for instance, not so much with Governor Ricketts, but with Governor Heineman, he, he appointed several Republicans and they turned out to be Mavericks. You know, they got down to the Capitol and they, um, we can get into the uniqueness of the Nebraska legislature. I saw there's a few questions there, um, but it's one, because we have nonpartisan primaries, but two, those nonpartisan primaries have made the legislature very independent. So they therefore um, enact rules such as secret ballot elections of the entire body present and things like that, that allow for people of the opposite or minority party um, to be in power and committee chairships and the speakership, right? And so, um, so that's where it comes. And so when the legislature does something that's reasonable or moderate, um, you know, all these partisans are just apoplectic. They're just like, oh my God, what's going on down there? Particularly when they see two thirds of their um, body being registered Republicans in their personal sense, not on the ballot, but you can still be registered um, personally. They're going, what is going on down there? And so the partisans kind of lose their mind and they go, well, we got to somehow take this over. Um, but, you know, I, Nebraskans, again, hold the nonpartisan Nebraska legislature in high esteem. And the great thing about nonpartisan primaries is moderate people can win. Coalition builders can win. So people who are very ideologically aligned to the far right or the far left, as long as they're coalition builders and they're trustworthy and they work hard, they can win. Um, and so Nebraskans overwhelmingly send those people down to the Capitol um, and they hold the power. And that's the power of nonpartisan primaries because then that system perpetuates itself. That's fascinating. All right, we're gonna open it up for some questions here. I'm gonna start with Andy Crossfield from Florida. Andy has a question about the role of political parties in an, in an open system. Go ahead, Andy. Hi, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Brenda Carr, for inviting me. This is really interesting. I um, am in Florida, and there is no more hyper-competitive state than Florida, it, at least in my estimation. And um, it seems to me that if you use the open primary system like top two, mm -hmm. and you're going to eliminate the, um, the party structure. And right now, the only way a candidate can get his word out is to use the fundraising ability of the party structure. We see candidates littered with great ideas, but no money to get them to the people. And I don't know how you're going to get a moderate to raise enough money. If they're not extreme, they can't raise any money. How do they get their word out? And, and uh, top two in Florida anyway, will end up with two Republicans on the ticket in, the, in November. I can yeah. Take yeah. Oh, yeah. So I do think that is a real, that's a real struggle, obviously, uh, for the open primary system. I also think though that you don't have to do away with political parties if you're going to have an open primary system. Um, so I still think that the structure of political parties can be there for the voter file, for the fundraising, um, for the, you know, strength of us sending out slate cards. Um, but I think that for voters who uh, don't really care about that partisan ID, it would make democracy much better if partisan labels were not on the ballot. I do think in cases that will mean in some races that two Republicans or two Democrats are the choices for the general election. Um, and I think that that's true for a lot of our municipal and city elections right now as well. Um, but I do think in the end, it, yes, there will be some growing pains, but I think that this should be a move that we move to. Now, well, Jane, why not? Why don't we just go to an independent, an NPA, we call them NPAs down here, no party affiliation. Why don't you allow them to select a ballot on voting day? I mean, that yeah. you, can res you can reserve the two party system. You can still have the fundraising ability, but you involve them, which is about a third of the electorate down here in Florida in the election. Why, why to go top, top two? I'm, I'm all for pro open primaries. Yeah. Why don't we just allow them to, to choose their ballot? I think that that is absolutely probably the middle road in the more likely scenario that you could see Democrats in particular getting on board with to try to push this then to make it a law in other states. Um, so, how did, so how did you get the law passed in Nebraska that would allow um, someone to choose a, the, the, that made the Democratic Party allow independents to vote in their party? How did you get that passed? 
Yeah, so here's the little secret that most Democratic parties won't tell you, including Florida. I grew up there. I love the chair there, Chair Rizzo. Um, so I was born and raised in plantation. Uh, the, the issue is that political parties have the ability to shape the rules of their own primary process. So for president, and then the, in the vast majority of states, some states have some laws that prohibit this, but in the vast majority of states, you also get to create the process and choose if independents can take your democratic ballot for the primary system. So it really is on the shoulders of democratic parties all across the nation to make this change. Is there any, any is there any truth to the hesitation that the parties say that Republicans will just register as independents and then choose that ballot? Uh, yeah, I always hear that. And that was the lead argument against me in the Democratic Party here in Nebraska when I was pushing for this reform. But the reality is, sure, are, you know, are a handful of people and maybe even hundreds of people going to do that? Yes. Is it going to be the vast majority of voters? Absolutely not. So there is no evidence that those like shenanigan things happen in this system. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll say one thing on this too. I mean, I, I've never had a problem fundraising. Um, as a as a candidate without a party and in fact I think it's better because one of the things that a lot of partisan caucuses hold over their members is if you vote certain ways um, you will not get funding or support we'll yank it in fact we'll find somebody fund them and you won't have any resources good luck I don't want the parties fundraising for me and I've had no problem fundraising six figures for my own campaign from a wide variety of Democrats, Republicans, moderates, and everybody in between. I actually think it's better. I mean, I, there's a lot of things I think about money in politics. I think we need to take most of it out and do a bunch of other things. But as the system currently is, Citizens United and all that, I think it's better that the parties are not involved um, with the fundraising for my campaign. Now, the parties do help out. Like if I asked um, the Democratic Party on the local or state level, hey, can I send out a fundraising email or an email asking you to come to my fundraising? They'll do it. Um, and that'll be really helpful and I'll raise some money from it. Um, but most people don't do that because of the traditions in our nonpartisan legislature. So the fundraising side, there's plenty of, of money to fundraise out there. I think what it does though, is it makes you more independent as a legislator. Um, and number two, what it does is um, make it so that you actually have to go out and do the work and meet people and convince them that your vision is the right vision, both with people who have resources, but also people at the door. Well, I, I love I love the upside. It's just that the reality of the situation is you don't get a chance to do those good things unless you can get the message out. Totally. And and we we can also have a whole nother conversation, Andy, too, about um, how that also limits cer certain people from being able to run who aren't politically connected and, and all that. And there's all kinds of disparities there that are bad so thank you so much andy those are really great questions i'm really glad we got into that question now from kathy stewart in uh your co-author jane uh from new york about the cultural aspects of coalition building go ahead kathy thanks john thanks senator morfeld and it's great to see you jane always good to talk um i had a question uh that's both connected deeply to the issue of how elections and the legislature is structured in Nebraska, but also to your experience building the coalition um, against the Keystone Pipeline. And, um, and also thank you for your book, Harvest the Vote, um, where you talk about this in some detail. And one of the things that I think is very um, interesting in your work as, a, as an organizer and as the chair of the party is the work to build these cross-partisan coalitions, and you talk a lot about the importance of the cultural aspects of doing that and of building trust. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because a theme I'm hearing in what both um, Senator Morfeld is sharing and you is that there's a culture that's different in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, th I thought maybe you could share a little bit about your personal experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So let me just, I, I'll tell a story, I think, that would kind of illustrate this. And so, you know, on Keystone XL and even on these ballot campaigns, 
uh, the whole philosophy and the work that we're doing of organizing at the local level is to make sure that we're bringing in different people who all have an interest in the ultimate goal, right? So the ultimate goal for Keystone was to stop it. Some people came to the table because of water property rights, some for sovereign rights of the tribes and others for climate change. Uh, but we all had that goal and the same will be true for these ballot initiatives that we're trying to pass. So one thing is that in Nebraska, we're, you know, we had actually a law and then Governor Ricketts and Heinemann ruined it, not allowing corporate agriculture. Um, so that unfortunately now is encroaching on a lot of our family farmers and ranchers. And we still have a strong tradition of family farming and ranching here. So Costco wants to come into our state and build these massive chicken barns where they can literally process a million chickens a week or up to 2 million chickens a week at one processing center. So don't buy the five buck chickens uh, at Costco. Those were tissue ones, it's very bad for family farming. So this was a problem and family farmers and ranchers knowing my work on Keystone came to me asking if I could help. So I went to a meeting at a farmer's house. I never asked if he was a Republican or a Democrat and independent, right? I just go to his house and we eat a meal together and we talk about the strategy that we're gonna use at a zoning meeting that we were all about to go to. And we had done a lot of work ahead of time, but this was in preparation of that. There was a rancher there who I didn't know, and I had never been to this small town's zoning board, which is that was going to be at the firehouse down, downtown in a town of like 600 of Nickerson. And so he said I could follow him. So I get in my minivan, I follow his pickup truck, and I see his bumper stickers. So one of them was a, you know, I support the NRA, uh, and one was the Tea Party. And then there was another one that said, if you think guns kill people, then pencils uh, fail tests. So I get, I, you know, we pull up to the, you know, place where the meeting was going to be held. I get out of my minivan. He comes over to my minivan and said, so what do you think about my bumper stickers? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so in my mind, I, you know, like quickly went through two scenarios, right? The first one was I could tell him that I thought his bumper stickers were stupid and here's you know all the reasons why guns actually do kill people. Um, or two, I could talk about the areas where we have common ground, which the past 10 years of Keystone obviously taught me how to do that. So I also use humor in a lot of my organizing. Uh, and I think without that, uh, breaking down barriers with using humor, that also is really important in cultural settings. And so I just put my arm around him and I said, you know what? Like, I don't see a single Republican Demo you know, leader uh, at a lot of these meetings that we are going to when we're talking strategy. But you know I'm a Democrat, you know I disagree with a lot of those bumper stickers and will probably disagree on abortion because I just put that immediately right out there. I said, but I'm standing here, I'm standing with you and I'm gonna stand with you as we go in there and we win this vote. And that immediately diffused anything. Uh, we did go into that room and we beat that vote and saved that small town from a Costco chicken plant but you know, I've had so many of those uh, examples, whether it was helping ranchers kind of create a more fair system of massive wind development, because I think everybody thinks that, you know, everybody wants a lot of wind and clean energy, except when it's on your land in your backyard, it's a very different scenario and how do we balance that? So as Democrats in independence coming together, um, you have to be, where people are comfortable and that's in their setting and it's going to make you uncomfortable and one of our leaders who passed away last year frank lemire he always would say like change does not come unless you make yourself and others uncomfortable and that's where we're at right now right we have to make the democratic party uncomfortable with the fact that independents have to have a place at the table if we're going to create real change i just want to Go ahead, I just want to throw one quick comment. Thank you so much for that, Jane. And I just wanted to let everybody know that um, you really stood with independence in the Independent Voting Network last year in our Eyes on 2020 campaign, where we really tried to raise this issue and make many Democrats uncomfortable from Arizona to Florida. And I just want to give a, another public shout out of appreciation for your being willing to do that and stand with us. Well, I'm going to thank you. I mean, I plan on running for one of the DNC officer spots in January when they come open. Um, and so hopefully I get that so I can really push this at the national level on the inside. Yeah. 
Thanks, both of you. A uh, question from Dre Samuelson in South Dakota about whether uh, efforts to expand the open primary would uh, succeed. Go ahead, Dre. Yep, uh, thanks, John, and great to see you, Adam and Jane. Um, so that was my question. If there were a ballot initiative in Nebraska to establish open primaries for all elections, um, and would it likely pass? And this would be to you, Adam. Um, if there were such an effort, would you help lead it? Put me on the spot, Dre. Um, yeah, no, it's good to see you, Dre. Um, from my, from my, my other adopted state, South Dakota. Um, but uh, in any case, um, yeah, I mean, so first off, um, I think that there would be broad support um, for a ballot initiative um, expanding open primaries, because just so everybody knows, right now, open primaries is legislature and below as it is. Um, so all of our statewide offices are not um, elected by open primaries. And that's just because the genesis of our state legislative system was the 1930s ballot initiative that made us a one house legislature and nonpartisan. Um, and so um, I think this is a system that, I know it's a system that Nebraskans respect and I think there would be broad support for it. Um, if there was a ballot initiative, I'd be honored to help help run it in some capacity. Um, I've it's interesting in, in the Nebraska legislature. There's some things I've been able to pass that are pretty that I'm excited about. There's other things I have not been able to pass um, in the legislature. So I've I've started going to the ballot a lot more often on things like Medicaid expansion and now medical marijuana. And so um, who knows that could be our 2022 push. That would be great. A quick follow up question to that. Um, Senator comes from Donna uh, Limper in Illinois about top two or top four. Go ahead, Donna. Sorry, unmute myself. Um, do you think if you went to top four open primaries that would change your outcomes in top two? Like, do just Republicans and Democrats get elected? Do you ever get independents or third party candidates elected? What do you feel about top four versus top two if you, if you have an opinion on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess I haven't thought too much about the dynamics, Donna. I mean, you do see in some districts, um, it's, you know, and in some districts, there's just all kinds of dynamics. For instance, in greater Nebraska, we have a lot of just one person runs for the office because they can't afford to be eight hours away from the Capitol in their business or their job, right? Um, and in other cases, like my district, which is a fairly liberal district, you often get two Democrats in, in many cases, not all the time. Um, and in other districts, you get the, the yeah, so I'm kind of rambling on. I guess I don't have an opinion on it. So what it would look like for you, I just want to make sure I'm clear, is four people would advance from the, from, the, from the primary into the general, and then the person with the most votes in the general would win, right? Plurality. I mean, it might make more sense if you do go to statewide to have a top four. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, I mean... I can't say I'm opposed to that in the sense that it will provide more diversity of viewpoints. It obviously complicates it a little bit for the, for the voters, but the thing that I always get frustrated with my colleagues about is voters aren't stupid, okay? Like voters can determine who they like. It's not that complicated. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I think that that would provide more diversity of viewpoint and more options at the ballot box. Great. A uh, question from Jesse Fields in New York. Go ahead, Dr. Fields. Well, thank you both for being here. It's great hearing about what's happening in, in Nebraska. And, and thank you also, Jane, for your outstanding leadership. I was involved in the campaigns to open the, to have the Democratic Party open its primaries. Um, and so I, I appreciate what Kathy was saying and just wanted to second her. her thank you. Um, my question is kind of uh, similarly a question about culture and community building. Uh, so in terms of the effort to possibly expand nonpartisan elections in Nebraska to statewide and federal offices. The, the, as you mentioned, there is a growth in nonpartisanship you know, in Nebraska as well as nationally. More people are moving away from the parties. And also we're in the context of the, 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 the protests and the cry for racial justice and equality. And I think you know, the, 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 the whole cry for and demand for equality also, I think, includes a demand for transforming our political process. And independents and nonpartisan voters, in fact, do not have equal voting rights. We're not allowed equal voting rights in the political process. 
Um, and so also one of the things that I found very moving and for me is an expression of a desire for nonpartisanship to break down barriers and divides is the fact that people from all communities, diverse communities, including white Americans, have been involved in, in demanding and supporting black lives and have been out protesting. I find that very, very extraordinary. So the thing that I'm, I wanted to know if you're, if such a campaign for nonpartisan elections, furthering nonpartisan elections in Nebraska could possibly be connected to those movements, to that cry for equality and for justice. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for me, this is about, you know, justice at the ballot box is really providing a more level playing field for candidates. There's no question some of the gubernatorial candidates that we've had or attorney general candidates that we've had the past couple of cycles as Democrats would have won if there wasn't a party ID next to them. There's just no question about it. Um, we have ended up with lesser than candidates representing us in statewide office or in the US Senate uh, because of the partisan ID. And because of the nonpartisan ID, we've been able to elect Latino, African American, um, young rural folks to the legislature, which if there was a partisan label on them, they would not be there right now. Um, but we've never, never elected a, a woman to represent the first or the second congressional district in the state of Nebraska, uh, which is absolutely shocking. Uh, and we've only had one woman governor in our state's history, and it was decades ago. So I think that not only for racial lines, but for gender as well, if there was not a partisan ID, it would open that up. It would give people permission to vote for the candidates who are representing their values and kind of IDs, ideas, but they get then pulled into, well, they're not a Republican, so they don't stand with me on guns and abortion. And so I'm gonna go with the Republican, even though I think that they're a lesser candidate. So it would, be a tr it would bring a tremendous amount of justice. There's just no question. Well, and particularly in Nebraska, to bounce off what Jane is saying, um, it, also, it also allows people that are elected to those offices to vote more of their conscience or take actions based on that, right? Because they're not focusing on getting reelected by a very narrow part of the electorate, particularly in a state like Nebraska, where it's ideologically, you know, bent towards one direction. And so I think you would see statewide officers, constitutional officers who hold real executive power, um, feel more pressure um, to take action on social justice issues, which are oftentimes promoted by minority interests um, in many states like Nebraska, right? Um, because that's a voting block that they know that they will be held accountable to next cycle. So if it isn't a moral thing in their head, there's an actual, you know, there's an accountability mechanism. Whereas right now, a lot of our statewide elected officials, all of them, not all, not a lot of them, all of them are elected by a very narrow minority um, of their party. And that's all they feel accountable to. Um, and, uh, and that's problematic, particularly in the social justice and the civil rights um, perspective in Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you both. Final question of the day. This comes from Hugh Campbell in New Jersey. Um, uh, a question about peer pressure. Partisan peer pressure, triple P. Go ahead, Hugh. Are you still with us, Hugh? Let's see, I think you have to unmute yourself, Hugh. Huh. All right, well, let me ask Hugh's question. I think we're having audio problems because Hugh is still here, but we can't hear him. Um, Hugh's question is, the lifeblood of our political parties is peer pressure. Has Nebraska managed to reduce or eliminate party peer pressure? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess, you know, Again, my world is very different than um, other state legislators' world. So let me just give you a little context. I'm gonna answer the question. And the answer is, I don't feel a ton of peer pressure from my party um, 
you know, partially it's because I align with my party on a lot of issues and it's not a problem. But also in other states, um, I talk to my colleagues and they're like, well, how do you introduce that bill? Like, and, and how did you get away with doing that or, or co-sponsoring this? And what it comes down to is we don't have partisan caucuses in the Nebraska legislature. Now there's no law against it, obviously. That's a first amendment, you know, you can um, create your own groups and associations as much as you like, but because of the nonpartisan nature of our unicameral and the historical history of it, we don't come together as Republicans or Democrats informally or formally within the body. And so there's no top down fundraising mechanism, nomination mechanism, um, voting type of blocks, um, and so I don't feel that peer pressure. However, it's something that my colleagues in other states have to feel every day on both sides of the aisle, right? Um, and for that, that is just, I mean, that in of itself is so freeing and it gives you the ability to build these cross-partisan coalitions like Jane did on, on her issue um, within the legislature. And it leads to real results. Now, are there still strong ideological divisions in the legislature? Absolutely. But there aren't the political consequences for bucking your normal ideological lines that you have in other legislatures. Everything from not being nominated to your office the next primary or losing all of your fundraising money or losing your office space or your committee chairship or, you know, whatever, whatever is important to you, right? Um, they, they don't have those things. And so I don't feel the peer pressure. That being said, I have a lot of constituents in my district who are very liberal and hold me accountable. I also have a lot of constituents in my district that I have to answer to um, that are you know, either independent or um, Republican and conservative and hold me accountable as well. Yeah. Just, it reminds me, just to throw in a little story, what you're saying, uh, Senator, um, talking with a legislator in California who described before California went to uh, nonpartisan top two primaries, there was a, the, the legislature was a mess and there was two Democrats and two Republicans who decided to create something called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And they were so chastised by their party leadership, they had to meet in secret at a diner after midnight. And even then they were still found out and censored by their legislative leaders. And now California, it's much more like Nebraska where Democrats and Republicans who have real differences are able to work together in the open. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's also an interesting thing about the legislature that I don't think we've mentioned in that every single bill that gets introduced gets a hearing. And so there is a very um, citizen led movement within the legislature. So I think if there's any kind of peer pressure that the senators feel, they feel it from citizens. Um, because they have to sit in those hearings and listen to citizens testify on those bills. Now, sometimes, of course, there's bills that only have two testifiers and maybe they represent one of the lobbying groups, but the vast majority of these kind of like big hot button bills, uh, there is a ton of citizen involvement and in grassroots organizing to move that ball forward. And, you know, you really do see the cross-partisan uh, we would have never been able to end white clay. There's about, a, you know, white clay was a town, a population of less than 100 that was selling millions of cans of beer illegally to tribal members that, you know, couldn't purchase beer on their uh, dry reservation. And it was a Republican and a Democrat who came together to create the bill to end that and really pulled their party members into that movement. The governor was very opposed to it because it meant less economic money going into kind of the one person owning the beer store. And that Republican, Senator Brewer, is facing now um, a lot of money being thrown against him. But the voters voted overwhelmingly for him in the primary. So I just think that continues to show how powerful the nonpartisan unicameral is and the really change that you can bring. Well, uh, Jane Kleb, uh, Adam Warfeld, thank you so much. I really, honestly, we at Open Primaries have talked for years about one of our missions is to make sure everybody in the country knows what you guys are doing because not enough people do. They don't know the Nebraska story. Um, and really wanna ask all of you to help in that mission. Uh, Jeremy put in the chat section our, our report, Myth of the Red State. Please share it, share this, the, the video, 
of this um, of this Zoom. All the Zooms from the summer are up on our website. I'd encourage if you if you didn't participate in in some of them, go back and watch them. They're all under an hour. We're, we try to keep things brief. Um, but thank all of you for participating this summer. We're going to resume right after Labor Day with a mega Zoom. Uh, we're partnering with the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, of which we are board members, on a open primary spotlight in which we will be putting on display all the political, all the open primaries campaigns from around the country and having an opportunity to talk with leaders from every one of those campaigns about what they're doing. This, this Zoom is going to be for journalists, for legislators, and activists and supporters like you. So stay tuned uh, for an announcement about that in August. Uh, again, Adam and Jane, thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Have a great rest of the summer and take care. See you guys.